Any other? Okay, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, motion has been made and seconded to accept the minutes as corrected. Any other discussion? All those in favor, can we say aye? Aye. aye. Opposed? Okay, minutes were accepted unanimously. Oh, okay. With one exception. Okay, so for today, uh, okay, 7.45. Well, it's a little early, but why don't we get going. So uh, if you could introduce yourself and tell us why you're here. Thanks. So I'm John Ellis. I live on Teal Street. Uh, I am a um, town meeting member and a member of the Arlington Tree Committee. And I'm going to present some results of a tree inventory that was conducted um, last summer. The inventory was funded by a grant the tree committee wrote to the state um, DCR. Uh, and we mapped all of the town's street trees, uh, an asset which prior to the town had little understanding or knowledge about what, what it was and how many, even how many trees there were. If you look at the town annual reports, it says there's 20,000 trees the DPW maintains, as you'll see in a moment. That's, that's not entirely accurate. Um, so we had um, uh, two interns, which were paid through the grant. Uh, we also had about 25 different in, uh, volunteers who came out and put in about 250 hours walking uh, every public street in town, every private <coughs> street in town. Uh, and mapping every tree that they found in the planting strip between the sidewalk and the road, uh, town-owned land. They used a smartphone app called Open Tree Map uh, and populated a map which is at opentreemap.org slash Arlington and has recently uh, been transferred to the town GIS uh, program as a layer and will soon be released to the public as a, as a layer on the GIS. Uh, so each of these green dots represents a tree that was mapped by either a volunteer or an intern, and the brownish colored dots are empty planting pits, which is an interesting data point for reasons I'll explain in a moment. For each of those records, uh, each of those dots, there is a record about the tree that sits there, and there were a number of things that we wanted to record. First of all, we recorded where it was, obviously. Second, we recorded what was the species. Uh, next, we recorded the size of it, uh, specifically the diameter, which you measure at, at chest height. Uh, and third, uh, the condition of, of that tree. And the program automatically populates uh, data about the ecosystem benefits of that particular tree. So this particular tree uh, on Mass Ave, you can see its ecosystem benefits of carbon dioxide, energy conservation, carbon dioxide removal, stormwater filtration. And an interesting thing that we've learned about through a collaboration that we're now doing to do further data, data analysis with a, a, a research uh, lab uh, class at Boston University is that the data on ecosystem benefits, particularly carbon dioxide removal uh, for street trees in suburban environments, understates those benefits because this data is used using U.S. Forest Department data about tree growth rates. But as a store of carbon, a tree in a suburban environment or an urban environment actually grows faster and puts away more carbon in a given year because it has less competition, it's getting fertilized by pet waste and yard runoff, um, and it has a longer growing season because of the heat island effect. So the ecosystem benefits are probably somewhat understated uh, in these data. In total, the map looks like this. Um, and the grant called for us to map just the public street trees, but we had extra time with the interns, so we also uh, mapped all of the uh, private street trees. We mapped large uh, trees on uh, the bike pet trail. We mapped trees in the cemeteries, uh, at schools, in parks. Um, and altogether, we mapped 10,500 uh, public trees, um, 8,750 which were public street trees. Uh, and we also found 6,401 empty planting sites, meaning a spot that was large enough for a tree to be planted. Um, so uh, that wasn't the slide I was expecting. I'm sorry. How many trees? I'm sorry. How many Ten, 10,500. Um, it's total. 10,500 uh, trees and. Um, 
750 were public street trees. How many empty spots? 6,401. There's a space big enough for a tree. Yeah. Maybe there was a tree there in the past. It's hard to hard to say. What, what so, you do, excuse me. What you do about parks? So we were, we, we we didn't measure every tree in Mountain Park or every tree in you know um, uh, you know every uh, on the bike trail. We, we we measured trees that DPW might be interested in because they might have to maintain that tree. Uh, if it was along a path and it was a large tree and it was a tree that, you know, potentially could be a threat to residents and, and, and maybe because it was poor condition, DPW would have to deal with it, we, we measured it. But if it was, you know, in an area that was sort of isolated, it, DPW doesn't care if it, it falls. Um, so here we see in aggregate all of those ecosystem benefits of all of the public street trees. Um, and these trees are estimated to be removing almost 5 million uh, pounds of CO2 a year. They're filtering stormwater, um, 14 million gallons. They're conserving energy for residents who are nearby and public buildings that are nearby. Uh, removing pollutants from the air, an estimated annual benefit of um, $630,000 a year. There's also another way that you can measure replacement value, which is based on the size of the trees and using one of these programs, which is fairly broadly used in other communities. We came up with an estimate of, say, 35 to $40 million replacement value of the public street trees. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we were measuring their health, and 57% of the trees were recorded to be in good condition. The dead and the poor trees are, are useful data points because prior Prior to now, the way that DPW has always managed trees uh, is uh, on demand, per request, uh, responsive. If somebody wants a street tree planted, they plant one. If somebody calls or files a or web request that there's a dead tree or a damaged tree, they respond to that. But with this data, we're able to uh, more you know, pr predict and more accurately use our resources because now we can look at, you know, trees in poor condition that are over 30 inches uh, and likely to be things that DPW is going to want to manage. So we, when we send out to bid to uh, contractors that DPW hires, we don't have to say, well, we you know, just go at it. We can say, here are 300 trees that are over 30 inches in poor condition that we want to keep alive, and we can target our resources on those trees, which is something we couldn't do before. Doing additional analysis, we can start to study how the Arlington canopy compares with other communities and with industry standards. And the red line that you see in this uh, display is what an ideal distribution of tree sizes would be. And obviously, because there's mortality in trees, you want to have more smaller trees uh, so that as they age and as you have mortality, you can maintain the size of your canopy. And we see here that there's a significant gap in the young trees. Arlington has likely not been planting enough trees um, because we see this, this gap. And obviously, if you project this into the forward, it, uh, future, it, it looks like Arlington's tree canopy is going to be declining as these trees age and you have natural mortality unless there's significant new planting. We also were uh, measuring, as I mentioned, uh, species. and. Um, there are some rules of thumb that are used in the industry about um, the distribution and diversity of your tree canopy. And you want to have a diverse tree canopy so that should a pest or disease that only affects one species come through your town, um, your entire canopy is not destroyed. And in Arlington, um, so the, and the rule is this, they call it the 30-20-10 rule. And so you don't want to have more than 30% of one family, 20% of one genus, and 10% of one species. And we have 42% Norway maple. Um, so we're way out of line with this 10% rule. And it's not that we necessarily want to get rid of all of the Norway maples, it's that it's a risk factor. Um, and there is no particular Norway maple pest at this moment, but this idea of, of having good diversity and good distribution isn't just a hypothetical. In the city of Worcester, uh, they, when the Asian longhorn beetle came through, which attacked certain kinds of species that were widely distributed in Worcester, there were people who went to work in the morning living on a tree-lined street and came home with no trees on their street because they had all been removed because of the pest. So it's, it's not that we're going to take out all of the Norway maple, although they are aging, it's that 
this is, is something that's a risk factor should we have a pest that attacks Norway maple. If you go back to that slide, we can't see in the back with the species are. So this is this is a uh, Norway maple. This is a Latin name. This is um, this is ash tree, which is about nine percent, uh, just under ten percent rule. And there is a pest that only affects ash trees called emerald ash borer, which is spreading in Massachusetts and can kill them quickly. Uh, this is a different maple tree. Um, this is this is um, calorie pear. This uh, I, I don't want to guess what that is because I, yeah. I don't know. Oaks there somewhere. What's that? Aren't there is there some oaks in the town? Uh, uh, yes, we have a. I mean, I could look up the exact. Um, so one of the things you can do in Open Tree Map is look up any species, and I can do that if you're interested. But if you just go to Open Tree Map, oh, that's more. It it's uh, these are the top four, um, top five. Um, so I mentioned that we were measuring not only the number of trees but empty planting sites or tree wells. So many communities set a goal that they want to have 90% of their tree pits occupied with a tree. Um, in Arlington, we're we're at about 58%. So there's quite a lot of capacity available for planting street trees. Currently the town's planting about 200 a year. If we were to move up to 300 a year, we could, and assuming consistent removal rates, we might reach 90% in, in 40 years. Uh, if we plant 800 trees in a year, which to be honest, no town in the state is, is doing that, uh, it would be seven or eight years. Um, we also looked at um, town annual reports and neighboring town annual reports to look at how was the town planting trees. And um, every year uh, DPW reports the number of trees they've removed and the number of trees they planted. So since 2006, Arlington is down net about 500 trees. Uh, since 1980, it's down net about 2,000 trees. Uh, you can see some neighboring towns have, have net increases. Um, so, um, yeah. So, Clearly there's a need for more trees. Um, so that was the part of the, the inventory that I, that, that was the, the information I want to communicate to you about the inventory and the results of the inventory. We can talk a little bit about what it costs to plant a tree and um, the town manager's proposed budget. Uh, but I did want to show you some other information since you're the finance committee and I thought this would be of interest. Um, so for a number of years we had an acting tree warden. We got a full-time tree warden about a year and a half ago. Uh, and the benefits of that tree warden are, are, are you know, not just that the position is staffed, but there are actual monetary <laughs> returns. Uh, and this here is an example. Um, we have this fund called the Trees Please Fund, and it's funded by street tree removals, which are, street trees are protected under state law, and if you remove it, you have to pay a fee to the town. So in 2014, we had an acting tree warden, and the Trees Please Fund, which is the recipient of these tree removals uh, fees, were collected $25. Uh, 2015, it was a little better, 1600 In 2016, the tree committee, working with the head of DPW, set up a new fee structure which more closely, uh, the fee structure changed from a $250 fee per tree to a tree that was related to the size of the tree. So it was $50 per inch of tree, so that you were actually compensating the town for the size of the tree, given that the that asset is worth more. So we had a new fee structure in 2016 up to $7,000. 2017, we have a new tree warden who's enforcing the law as it was intended and, and, and as it turns out a lot more actively than the previous acting tree warden. We also have the private tree bylaw, uh, which money goes to the Trees Police Fund. Uh, and in 2018, through the first six months, we're at $11,000. So there's a pretty significant return from having a tree warden. And there are a lot of other benefits of the tree warden, which in the town manager's budget is a position which is funded full time next year. It was not funded full time last year, it was only three days. Um, and you know, two quick examples of that. Uh, when we had our project in, in um, uh, East Arlington, Mass Ave, when the state came and funded the redevelopment of Mass Ave in, 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 East, in East Arlington, um, the state was in charge of planting trees. They hired a low bid contractor. The low bid contractor was uh, a former drywall contractor from uh, Western Massachusetts. They didn't really have any experience in planting trees. Yeah, eastern part of Mass Ave has about 100 trees that were planted. They were all misplanted. They were all planted at a depth so that the tap root will be um, strangled, basically, as it grows. So when these trees reach their optimum 
you know, eight, ten years lifetime, we're going to have high mortality rates because they were planted far too deep. In Cambridge, they're planted uh, so the taproot is like four inches above. These things were six or eight inches down. So these trees are going to have high mortality. The town accepted this planting uh, because we didn't have an acting tree warden. Um, we, we, had, we didn't have a full-time tree warden. Um, you know, flash, flash forward a couple years, now we have a project at Uncle Sam Park. We have a tree warden. Again, the state contractor misplants the trees at the Uncle Sam Park. But now we have a tree warden who identifies this and gets them to plant the trees correctly so we can expect that they can be healthy. And there are a lot of examples of that. There was a, there's 10 new trees on Lake Street which were planted only because the tree warden noticed that uh, one of the utility companies illegally cut down a tree and, and got on them for, for planting trees. So there have been some pretty great benefits from having a, a tree warden. Um, okay. That was all I had. Oh, okay. Um, questions? Okay, David? It seems like you're bringing up good examples, but we're not flushing out fully like the economic benefits of the tree warden. Because we are, I don't know where it is in the budget, but to your point, there is an ask to go full time, and that is more money to the town because the town has to pay. So, are there more examples of either self funding through, you know, obviously paying into this fund or other things that, you know, or money saved through misplanning identification that, you know, would make this, uh, make the evidence that this is a truly a self funded? Uh, staff position. Um, you don't have to answer it right now. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. No, I, and I don't know that it would be self-funded. Well, I guess that's the concern. You know, one of the concerns would be that. You know, but it would be good to kind of bring that back to the table. But it sounds like there is evidence, but maybe we could be better find out. Well, who? Okay, just a bit of confusion. Uh, so, who funds the tree fund? In other words, if the town goes out and takes down a tree, mm -hmm. does money get transferred from the public works budget to the tree yes. budget? Yes. Okay. And, and if a developer wants to remove a tree to put a wide driveway in, they pay into that fund. Okay. Talk. How do we manage um, utility companies like uh, the electric company when they trim trees for the power lines? Is there, is there a management system there? Um, you know, the, the tree warden has a relationship with the arborist who works for the utility. Um, you know, in theory, the utility will come through every four or five years, um, which one might think they do one fifth of the town in each year, but that's not how they actually do it. They're, they do, they might go through the entire town once every four years. Um, so, I mean, it doesn't always work very well, uh, but, you know, the tree warden is, it, it works with the crews, tells them the standards that Arlington expects in terms of when they're cutting lines. Um, you know. Do they have to go to the tree warden? Can they just go in and cut down a tree? They so they do? cannot remove a tree. Okay. Yeah. Um, the state law is, is very uh, progressive. It dates back to the 1900s and uh, it's chapter 87. And no one in, in any town in Massachusetts can remove a public street tree uh, except under three conditions. Uh, a road widening, um, a tree that is an immediate hazard, uh, or a tree that is infested with a pest. In every other situation, uh, there, the tree warden uh, is empowered to hold a tree hearing at which anyone can object. Literally anyone can come to a tree hearing and object and then it gets appealed to the Board of Selectmen. So NSTAR would not be able to remove a tree. There is you know, enough trust, I guess, and collaboration that um, you know, if there's a tree that the tree warden has identified as dead that happens to be on a route that NSTAR is working on, uh, you know, they might you know, NSTAR might remove it as a courtesy. Um, and the town does generally not uh, trim any trees that are very close to the power, you know, power lines. They're working more on trees that are not overhanging power lines. Uh, Christine? I, I have two questions. One, first one is how many appeals to the, if you know, to the Board of Selectmen have been denied? Um, well, 
Uh, so, um, uh, two, three years ago, um, the uh, acting tree warden, uh, <coughs> so, so the state, sorry, I'll give you more information. The state law requires that you post on the tree uh, for two weeks ahead of time prior to any tree hearing, and also in the publicly posted. So two years ago, I read in the legal notices that uh, there was going to be a tree hearing. I had heard from the head of DPW that people rarely attended tree hearings, and I was curious to see why. Uh, so I went and I looked at the tree, and there was no posting on it. Uh, I objected to that tree removal. This was, happened to be on Webb Cowan. Uh, and the uh, process was that I should have been, this should have been appealed to the Board of Selectmen. The tree warden told the Board of Selectmen's um, admin that he was the tree warden and it didn't matter that I had objected to it. Uh, but Mike decided that it was appropriate to follow state law and post on the trees. So in the two years since then, when the town has started to post on a tree, a not surprising result is that many people are turning up at tree hearings. And this fall, we had a tree hearing in front of the Board of Selectmen. Again, on Webb Cowan Street, the entire neighborhood turned up, and the Board of Selectmen decided not to allow the tree removal. So how many have been, so I would say since two years ago, uh, there have probably been five or six that have gone before the Board of Selectmen, and um, I don't know, maybe three have been denied and two have been allowed. I'm not sure exactly. That Webb Cowan example, didn't the developer go ahead and cut the tree anyway? He, he cut the roots and uh, received significant fines. He cut the roots, and the, the, the tree is still there, and we'll see if it survives the winter. My second question is, we don't have, and probably never will have enough money to replace, or to plant as many trees as we want. So how would we go about deciding which, where to plant in Arlington? If we, if you have, if we have a bundle of money, who, who decides, how do we go about, what's the best process, has been, there been any, um, any plan developed to decide where these trees are going to go? So, you know, to date, again, it was all based on requests. Um, we do have data now that shows us the, the you know, in every census block, um, the number of empty planting pits, the number of trees. So we have a good idea for in every section of town how many trees and what are the places that need more street trees. The tree committee is working with DPW on a management report, which is a, a required outcome of the grant that we received. Um, some of those issues will be addressed in that. Um, but having more funding for trees is, is something new to DPW, and I, and I don't think there's a fully fleshed out strategy yet. Okay, so if you could do a, a real quick demo of open tree map and tell people how to go to it, you know, and just what it is that we're spending, uh, was it 3000 a year for that? Yeah, I think that, I don't know that the town intends to keep open tree map um, okay. moving forward because it's all moving to um, GIS. But um, this is the map. And, um, and you get there from opentreemap.org slash Arlington? Slash Arlington, yeah. So you had somebody asked about oak trees. So we can look at all of the um, uh, okay, we have 273 oaks that we we'll label as oak. We have 223 pin oaks. <coughs> Two here on Mount Vernon Street. So I can look up any species. I can look up the condition. We can. Uh, you know, we can look at... Um, can you go to Teal Street? Teal Street. <coughs> we don't need that anymore. No, but I planted an oak tree there uh. 20 years ago. <laughs> Just want to make sure it's on his list. This is only, this is only street trees, you understand? Yeah, no, this yeah. is a street tree. So here's Teal Street. Uh. Oh, I'd be better off doing the hybrid mode here. Did you plant the one right next on the corner of uh, Teal Street, uh, Prof. Sawin? This one's right. <coughs> There's an oak tree okay, right here, right? Is. Next to your house? Yeah. It should be. There's an ash. 
That's right in front. Black oak. Black oak. Okay. Doesn't say planted by. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, these were all compiled by a herd of volunteers and went out. Herd of volunteers and some interns. Yeah. 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 Does yours look as nice as that one, then? No. It's <laughs> just the picture. If I, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Dave. I just have a good question, sir. The present tree one. How long has the present tree one been in that position? I would say two years. I think he joined in uh, May of uh, the spring of 2015. Right. So <clears throat> the incident that you mentioned uh, of um, two years ago, I believe that was a different tree one. That's when the switch happened. The situation that I was talking about where he, they weren't posting it on the trees? Right. Yes, that was definitely the a previous tree, tree one. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, the new tree warden is, right. is that's very that's aggressively The whole thing shifted board. when this, this Absolutely. individual came on it, it, yeah. and, and started paying attention very to, significant to difference. something that hadn't been paid attention for a long exactly. time. Exactly. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Brent? I was just on the site, uh, my phone. They might have made a mistake in using the word diameter instead of circumference. I'm positive they did on the street in front, on the tree in front of my house, Could and the one true. next to it. Uh, it says it's 12 feet in diameter, uh, 12 inches in diameter, and it's not. So, just who's ever in charge of that might want to. It might just be that they used the wrong word and said should use circumference instead of diameter. But for trees, they should just caliber. Yeah, the, the, tr the interns had a, had a, had a uh, you know, a tool, the volunteers had a tape measure. It's possible they would have entered circumference. We did find some uh, errors <coughs> like that. Okay, just pointing it out that yeah. if you're talking about accuracy and inaccuracy, that kind of takes, muddies it up a little. When I look at that, I know the tree isn't that. Yeah, I mean, I, I assume there's, eight, uh, you know, data errors, but... Um, Labeling errors. Data errors of some kind, species. I mean, the, the thing that uh, people have looked at, the differences between paid, I mean, so before we did the, this volunteer, we got a quote from a company that does this professionally who wanted to charge the town $70,000 to do this. Um, and there have been some studies about comparing between volunteers, interns, and professionals. And the data is pretty consistent. Both groups miss trees. That is the most frequent data error is missing a tree, where you've gone up one street, mapped it, and just missed it. Did you have a question? Yes. Okay. Do you have a report? So there will be a tree management report which will be delivered to the state and will be a public document for the town about the results of the inventory and plans for spending money and how to deal with the issues that we identified. When? It's due in May. It would be a good thing on the website. Yeah. On the website. yeah. So it's due to the state in May? Right. Is it complete yet? No. Okay. So you've got to tidy it up and... Yeah, we're working with uh, Mike and t Tim to, to do that. Okay. I notice in Arlington Center, over the last several years, that the prime tree to go in were black locusts. In fact, almost exclusively black locusts. And I've been told there it's a very hardy tree and good in urban environments. Uh, but then again, you don't want to put all black locusts in. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a matrix of different variables. You want to have diversity. You want to have something that withstands salt. You want to have something that maybe withstands climates that potentially could be warmer. Um, so, you know, there's a the tree. This is what tree wardens think about and talk about. You know, is what are the best species? You don't want to plant. You know, the town hasn't always been great at planting the right size tree under power lines. You want to have a small tree that goes under power lines so you don't have the N-star problem, so you want to be planting the right species. <coughs> so there's a bunch of different considerations. Now, I thought they were going to replace the trees on Mass Ave that were dug too deep. Um, they did not get that agreement. They uh, got an agreement to replace the ones that had, had died, and they've gotten a bunch of replacements. Um, you know, in general, in, in any of these public projects, the contractors, and this has happened throughout Arlington, it happened um, in front of the Boys and Girls Club, the um, um, Parks and Rec project at the tennis courts there, uh, 
usually these trees come with a one-year warranty, which in practice means uh, they hope it rains. They're not going to come back and water the tree. They hope it rains, or if it dies, they hope the town doesn't notice it and call them on it. Um, and that's why some towns, including Cambridge, are now requiring as part of their tree planting contracts two years of watering, uh, which they track on a via GPS system that follows the truck around and makes sure it's spending enough time at each gator bag. Um, because, you know, if, if you don't require that, they, they put the tree in, they, you know, they hope it rains, they're not going to come back to water it. And, uh, you know, so uh, I guess in the Mass Ave case, they didn't water it ever, and so some of them died, so at least some of them are going to be replaced and were planted correctly because, as predicted, they didn't. <laughs> so I guess it worked to Arlington's advantage in that particular case since they yeah. David. Is, that the, is that the tree warrants uh, one of his, his or her responsibilities to think about some of those contracting terms that you just mentioned about we should have two years of warranty and a better track that kind of stuff because I mean it seems like I think two out of the last three summers we've had some sort of severe drought where you yeah. put these trees in jeopardy from yeah yeah, I mean that is the watering is is by far the biggest, you know, issue of tree health. And uh, you know, in Cambridge, the price of planting a tree, um, you know, they spend two hundred for the tree, four hundred for a contractor to put it in the ground, two hundred for year one water, two hundred for year two water. So thousand dollars a tree. Um, so keeping them watered is a big deal. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much okay. for coming. Great, thank you. Uh, very informative. Great, thanks. I, I would just like to make a statement, and that's that there's a wonderful book, I, I'm guessing you've read it, that's called The Hidden Life of Trees. I've heard of this, I haven't read it, but yeah, marvelous. people love just it. Yeah. Marvelous. Yeah. You wouldn't believe the yeah. things that you learn. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Treasurer. Yes. Would you like to come up here and Yeah, the only question I have is I walk up is in twelve years of sitting on this row, no one ever frightened me with cookies. So <laughs> when does those show up? <laughs> and when you left. I was gonna say it's like a victory celebration to get rid of me. <laughs> took a vote. I see how it is. You took a vote. Huh? Took a vote, got some cookies. I didn't know we had fancy technology. I would have put it up on the screen. <laughs> okay. Are you helping the leftovers to your office tomorrow? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Grab <laughs> that. I'll send that that way. And I think you want to talk about eight or nine, so I'll give you those as well. Everybody got the handouts? Okay. Floor is mine. Yours. All right. Articles 18 and 19. So, um, you have the handout. There are a lot of slides. We're not going to spend an even amount of time on all of them. I did one presentation for both the selectmen and the finance committee, and I just sent it to you. But some of the slides are really to sort of cajole the selectmen into, or remind the selectmen of things that they've said before. <laughs> so, Consolidated Finance Department, if you look at slide two, which I'll call if I go along, this is for Article 19, 
which would be a home rule petition to create a municipal finance department. The current recommended vote that I'm going to present to the selectmen on March 5th, Doug and I are going to, or town council and I are going to continue to work on refining it. But this is, as we start the first part of this, what it would talk about. It would talk about having a, creating a municipal finance department. The town manager will appoint someone as the director of finance who is suitably qualified. They go through the oath, things like that. And then what I did here is I allowed some degree of flexibility by saying the finance director shall be also be eligible to hold the position of comptroller, treasurer and collector, deputy town manager, assistant town manager. I, I did that because in creating a municipal finance department, the goal should not be to create headcount, bureaucracy, and things like that. So while I'm fairly certain if this were to pass, that the town manager would appoint the current deputy town manager as to, uh, to also hold the position of finance director, I think if you want to maintain flexibility over the long term, you have to create a buy or, or you have to change the town manager act in such a way that somebody else could conceivably also be the finance director. Because I think back five, six, seven years ago, you, you might not have picked the deputy town manager. You might have picked the comptroller. You might have picked someone else. So that's, that's why the language provides that first level of flexibility in it that says it could be more than just um, the deputy town manager as finance director. So I'm moving to slide three, and we're going to move through these kind of quickly. Um, it seems as though you're restrict. Does this wording imply that such a person must have the qualifications for all of these other positions? No, it means that the person who's hired to, to holds the title of finance director is qualified to be the finance director. So it says the, the town manager shall appoint a suitably qualified person to the position of finance director, period. The finance director shall be eligible to also hold the position of dun, 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 dun. And so, you know, I think it, what it does is it allows, you know, allows flexibility in, in municipal government. So if right now it might be the deputy town manager, 20 years from now, maybe, maybe the deputy town manager is better suited doing something else and the incumbent comptroller, the incumbent of something else, would be a better finance director. That's all it's trying to do is say, you know, we don't want to be in a situation where in 20 years we have to go amend the Town Manager Act because a new town manager wants to do something different or wants to eliminate a position. Maybe the new town, maybe the town manager comes along and says that the deputy town manager shouldn't even be the, in the finance department. So this allows things like that to occur. You're actually trying to make it more flexible. It's not clear to me from the wording that that's. I, maybe you'll run it by the, the council. And I did. He re, he reviewed it. He, so he thinks it's okay. All yeah, right. he thinks okay. it's okay. All right. So moving on to slide three. So you know, going through the background, which I think a lot of us know, and some might be catching up on. So we started talking about a consolidated finance department in 2011. So Alan Jones, sitting to my right, many of your left, submitted Article 51 to town meeting requesting the town manager research the possibility of a consolidated town in school finance department. Subsequent to that, the Department of Revenue came in, Department of Revenue came in, they did a financial management review, they made several recommendations, most of which were taking the town financial departments, which were, which at the time were just complete silos, working independently and start a process of consolidating them under a department head for, for a various reasons, better efficiency, better organization, management, things like that. So 2012, town manager came back to town meeting, Article 32 received the DOR report. That kicked off the process in the fall of 2012 of the town manager forming a coordinated finance stakeholders group to talk about the process of consolidating municipal finance departments on the town, first on the town side, you know, which would be the comptroller, the treasurer, the assessor who at the time was appointed by the Board of Assessors, purchasing and all rolling up under the deputy town manager. So group met 10 times. Um, there was a representative from each, each department on it. And so we can skip what I have is page three, which is slides five and six. Now we get to 2013. Town manager submits article 22 home rule legislation to town meeting. Um, it had a hearing at both the at start. Well, at first, had a hearing at the finance committee, which was I don't know why we were exiled over at town hall in the selectmen's hearing room. 
But I remember that night we were over there. Um, so we're hearing at the Finance Committee, it, it just, you know, sort of a sweeping change to municipal government that just wasn't a, a, a great appetite for it. I think I remember at the time actually sort of with, with Charlie sort of pushing against it and saying, this it just wasn't right. I mean, for me, I remember looking at the, 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 the people we had in the various positions, the tone and the tenor, some of the tension, the bitterness, and sort of no guided path to say, okay, if we do this, are we going to have more efficiency and are we actually going to save money? And so it, it did get out of the Finance Committee with a vote of no action. The selectmen, the town manager then went to the selectmen and recommended no action to them to avoid a floor flat fight at town meeting. And so that sort of faded away in 2013. So the concept of any type of grandiose sweeping municipal finance changed, uh, stopped. So we could skip Mr. Greeley's quote. If we skip over that 2013 org structure. So that's where we were at the end of 2013 when we talk about departments that are in, we, I think we refer to them as silos. So the Board of Selectmen in one silo have the town manager, the deputy town manager, and purchasing. The Board of Selectmen in a separate silo have the comptroller. The treasurer who's elected by the voters is in their own silo, and then at the time the Board of Assessors were, had their silo and they hired and supervised the director of assessment. So when we got to 2015, things started to change. Um, Article 15 Home Rule Legislation Board of Assessor change was put before town meeting and the proposal was to take the director of assessment and move the director from an appointee of, and supervised employee of the board of assessors to a, an employee of the town manager. So that passed town meeting 116 to 76. So it's about 60% of the vote. And that, if you go to the next slide, was the first slight alteration to the org structure. And so, you know, the director of assessment is now under the um, authority of the town manager, but since there isn't a finance department, he actually technically reports to the town manager, not the deputy town manager. Now we move two years. So I think that, you know, the thing I got out of that is, is interesting. Well, I don't know if there was a great appetite for grand change. There was an appetite in 17 for incremental change. 60% of the town meeting said, yes, an incremental shift is a good thing. Now we get to 2017. You know, both candidates for Board of Selectmen are running on a platform of, of creating a consolidated finance department and an appointed treasurer. I'm running for treasurer on a very, very clear message of, um, a consol of, of more professionalization in the treasurer's office and the overall coordination of the finance functions. The Selectmen put forward Article 19, which is a vote to, to change the treasurer from elected to appointed, and town meeting passes at 154.57. So again, we get to that second step going through town meeting where, you know, well, well we're at town meeting on the first incremental change of assessor was at 60%. They now swing to about 75% when it comes to an appointment of the treasurer, which to me points that town meeting has an appetite for taking these things one at a time, but town meeting doesn't have an appetite or there's not much of an appetite within the municipal government for a grandiose change. And then obviously coming up in April, 2018, is going to be the valid question before the voters on whether to actually make the treasurer an appointed position. So we can skip Dan and Diane on these two slides. So, you know, we got through 2017 election season. That, so what has gone on since then? So the interesting in this lot, of, the, all of this focuses on my office at town hall. So when I got elected, the very first thing I did is I signed a memorandum of understanding or memorandum of agreement, whatever it is, with the deputy town manager that said, moving forward, at least for the next three years, maybe longer, we are gonna run the treasurer's office as if it was a department of the town. So the deputy town treasurer is going to report directly or have dotted line authority, I guess you could say, to the, de the deputy town treasurer, have dotted line authority to the deputy town manager. Um, we're, we're, and, and we're just gonna work, we're gonna work as a finance team. Even if the bylaw doesn't say we are, even if the bylaw says we're all independent, we're gonna work together. We had, in order to execute this, we went to the, the respective unions, because uh, the def, deputy town treasurer is in SEIU. The professional staff are in AFSCME. We talked to them about it. They were happy with it. They bought into it. So they signed off on their own agreement with us to let this happen. And then starting in May, we just, we started to make it happen. I mean, we started working as a team. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. So if we move to the next slide, which I label April 2017, effective org structure. 
This is effectively day to day how the management of the town is occurring. Um, the treasurer and collector, the director of assessment, both report in to the deputy town manager who reports to the town manager who reports to the board of selectmen. And so next slide, so what improvements are happening? Like how does having a more consolidated finance function actually benefit? Well, the first thing, and it was kind of mortifying when I got there and found out this didn't happen, we, we have monthly department meetings. Like it's a very simple concept, but, in the, and I, I didn't put the comptroller in this. It's interesting, if Rich was still here on that prior slide, I would have put him in there because Rich was with us. We were all sort of together in terms of working as a single unit, but then he left. So to keep him in on that slide would have been awkward because the position is vacant. But we started having monthly department meetings. So, you know, the deputy treasurer, the comptroller, director of assessment, would everyone meets with Sandy, we go over what's happening, workloads, hot button issues, things like that. It, it's really helpful in terms of understanding the big picture stuff. IT will come, because a lot of discussion goes on about the munis conversion. Um, and it also helps on the little things. You know, you, you get a lot of team building and in camaraderie so you know like right now a lot of you most of you probably get your excise bills and the first thing people who've moved out of town and they if they've unregistered the car or something like that they send the email to me now i have nothing to do with it right so i gotta send over paul to your need to deal with but it's just sort of building that teamwork to say look we're going to be more efficient we're going to work together we're not going to be in silos and so you have a better a, a better flow of of work which is that second bullet i have which is you know, you have improved daily communication between departments, which ultimately is going to lead to high quality, higher quality work product. So you have fewer mistakes, you have fewer errors, you're not correcting things. It's, it's a good, it's a good thing. Also in terms of the munis conversion, it's been very helpful to work as a coordinated group and we've really been able to accelerate a lot of things we're doing. We got the property tax and excise tax, up, tax running in July. We didn't tell anybody, but now you're going to start to find out. We actually started doing we, we um, turned on the option for paperless billing in November, which is really cool. So if you actually go to pay your property tax bill, you can actually then sign up for paperless billing. Um, if you pay your excise bill online, you can then set up to get <coughs> email reminders, which was funny. There were people who paid their, they bought a card second half of 17, they got an excise bill. They didn't realize they set up, signed up for the reminder and then panic ensued when these reminders got shot up before the bills arrived. But a lot of those efforts take everybody involved. You know, the assessor's gotta be on board, the, Treasurer, the comptroller, IT. And when you don't have that silo effect, and we're all on the same team and we have one leader that we're accountable to, it, it's very, it, it, things move quicker, things move, move easier. Um, you know, the last thing I point to is, I just use a specific example, is our bond issuance this year went a lot simpler. And, and, and it was interesting, when I got to the treasurer's office, Mike and I went over the process. And again, because we have these independent offices, people would really put the, the offertory statement and things like that together in their own buckets. And sort of the buckets went up, so they went either went to Mike or Sandy, or it was kind of, you know, people weren't coordinating, they weren't working together. It was kind of a pain. Like, I don't know why the people at First Southwest didn't kill us at some point, but, you know, it got done, but it didn't get done very efficiently. But once you start working together and you say, okay, Mike's going to be the point, he's going to run it. Everyone, he's going to send out requests lists, he's going to send out and get it to him, and let's just get it done. And the process of putting it together went quicker. Then we got to the presentation, which I thought was fascinating. So we're about a week out from our S&P call, which is highly important, right? Because this is what your credit rating is based on. And traditionally how it would work, because we have these silos in town, is the treasurer's office would start the, the, the presentation by giving a 20-minute presentation from the treasurer's office to S&P. And that would be followed up by the town manager asking questions from anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes. So the total call would take 40 minutes to an hour. And it was kind of disjointed, right? And then I found out our call schedule for Monday. On Thursday, I get a um, First Southwest or whatever they're called now, Tadpole, Totem, what are they called? They're I'm called sure something else. They're called something else. I'm going to call them First Southwest. They send me the, the questions from, from S&P that they want answered. And there's about 25 questions. And a third of them are about the budget, a third of them are about management of the town, and the other third knock off other things like long-term liabilities. So when you look at what we've done in the past, you start to say, this is crazy. Like, let's just, Sandy and I said, why don't we just put a presentation together that answers the questions? So we put a presentation together that was different than answers the questions. 
And we get in the room, and Sandy goes first, and he down knocks off the third that are about um, budget to actual results. Adam goes second, he knocks off the middle third, which are budget to actual, I mean, that's about management to the town. And then I wrap up on the end with sort of the, the odds and ends. So start to finish, the call was 29 minutes with not a single one question. SMP asked one question. I think it was something I said. But it's just sort of, it's, it's sort of an anecdotal evidence of when you're working together, you start to go from these 40 minutes to an hour calls and this disjointed struggling process to smooth, efficient, you know, you're not, it's not being, you don't have that pain to get to the result and, and it works. And then the last thing I should add, they also had these other documents they wanted that Sandy and I had pulled together. And when the call ended, we flipped it off to First Shelf West and flipped it off to them and there was no follow up from them. We never heard from them again. Six days later, we get our AAA. So that's what we're talking about in terms of coordination. Um, so, what, so what are our goals, right? And then you throw a list them here. And we've talked about it. You eliminate the silo effect where everybody's working independently and it, it's aggravating, which leads to improved efficiency and productivity. You, do, you will get better, you'll get improved, what, I, what I'm gonna say, improved reporting process to internal and external stakeholders. And, and what I mean by that is a good example the, the other day, which is, an email comes in from the vice chair of the capital planning committee asking a, a question. And he sort of freely puts Sandy on, he has me on it, he has Mike Morse deputy treasurer on it. And so he asks a question. And I look at it and I think to myself, okay, well, there's no way I'm going to answer this before Sandy answers it. And I talked to Mike, I said, you're going to answer it? And he said, no, we're going to let Sandy answer it, right? Because we're not going to have Sandy Pooler, deputy town manager, give the vice chair one answer, and I'm gonna give the vice chair a different answer, and now we have inconsistency in the messaging and the reporting and things like that. So we just sort of sat back and waited for Sandy to answer. Now, if he didn't answer by a certain time, we would have called him and asked him if he needed something, and he would have called us. But it's sort of saying, you know, this is an improved process where we have consistency. I think the other consistency, and we had talked about it in the fall with some other stakeholders, is also the finance, like the finance committee book and other documents. So documents are arranged one way in the finance committee book, they're arranged another way in the, in the town manager's report. They're arranged another way in this report. And it allows you when you're working together to just have internal and external consistency. We're going to do it one way. It's going to be like this. And there's accountability for everyone. Um, inf obviously, you know, as we talk about information sharing and cross training is important. And I think these last two are really, 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 this last one's really like overlooked, but I think one of the most important ones is career paths for town staff. And why that's important besides job satisfaction and retaining good people is over the last five years, we've started to see, I don't want to call it a crisis, a real lack of quality financial people going in management positions in municipal finance. So we have now, if you are following, we have now gone out three times, posted the comptroller's job three times. The first time we posted it right before Christmas and Hanukkah, and the applicant, we got about 15 applicants, we screened them. I think there were two I would interview. So we were right at the finals. Right, no, no first round, we were at the finals. So we said, well, that didn't work. So we put a second round out there and it didn't get much better. We got a few more, so maybe we have five people and now we're on the third time. And so more than ever, because of this lack of, <coughs> of, of municipal talent, we really need to think about developing our own internal people, because remember, we're one of these communities that goes out all the time for our department heads in finance. We won, our last two deputy town managers were external hires. Our, our current deputy treasurer is an external hire. Um, our last comptroller and this comptroller are gonna be external hires. So this could start to become a problem. It wasn't a problem in the past, but it really could become a problem in the future. And, and you know, one of the things when I talked to Adam last year, and we were talking about reorganization of the treasurer's office, he had actually brought this up to me and said, you know, I think this is great because if we don't have a change, then we're going to lose the deputy town treasurer. And if we lose the deputy, I don't know how we're going to replace him. And, and at the time, I didn't quite understand it, but looking at how we're struggling to get a good bank of candidates for the comptroller job, you, it starts to come through on, on what our issue is. Higher quality work product and enhanced accountability. I mean, sort of the wrap up what we talked about. So if it were to pass, this chart that says consolidated finance structure is what it would look like. This would be the final 
if the, I should say, if the Consolidated Finance and the Treasurer became appo elect, appointed, this is what the final structure would look like. Question. Could you elaborate a little bit on the way in which the career, career has developed? Because yeah, so, so, so more or well, so it's interesting. I think a um, couple things. I had, you know, you kind of do sounding boards. You know, make sure you're not going off the rails or something like this. And um, I remember when I was talking to Rich Viscay and and Mike Morse about it. One of the things they had said to me, you know, I'd asked Mike. I asked Mike. I said, you know, do you ever want to be the deputy town manager? We were just at lunch one day, shooting the breeze. And he said, no, I want to be the best municipal treasurer that I can possibly be. But it would be nice to know that there was a career opportunity above that. And if I was a really good deputy treasurer, it's nice to know that there's a career path above it. You know, or, or like we have a management analyst that works in the treasurer's, uh, that works in the um, manager's office. And because all these groups are independently appointed, there isn't really a next step. So if you have a really good, you hire a really good management analyst. And the last one, I think last, our last management analyst lasted two years, I think. You know, it's a position that, it's a springboard. Like, I have no future in Arlington, so I leave. And so if you hire a really good management analyst, and they're talented, and there maybe there's a position you could say, oh, the, you know, deputy comptroller opens up, or deputy treasurer, somewhere where they could be developed. And then they have an opportunity to move up to comptroller, or they have an opportunity to move to treasurer, or they can move up to deputy town manager. Just that ability to grow your own talent versus having to rely on an external search, which is becoming more and more difficult. And we're, and we're seeing it. And I think, also I think the other thing, and the flip of that, John, is when you're hiring good talent, if they know that it's a career opportunity, so if you're hiring this like, if we, like really strong, you know, mid-30s comptroller, and they know that there's a future for them in Arlington over the course of 20, 25 years, then maybe they'll maybe that's enticing to come. Whereas if you're in this independent authority, which you've kind of heard rumblings of some, you know, disjointed administration, it's not really a career path. Maybe you don't come because there's nothing. You know, it's interesting. We do they do. Um, Carmen Loy, director of HR, does a compensation study every couple of years, and she just finished it in the fall, and she sent it out to all the department heads. We pay our department heads well. They're not underpaid versus their benchmark. So if they're not applying for this job, which is one of the higher paying comptroller jobs in the area, what's the problem? I mean, I think this would, in some ways, was one way to help solve issues like that. <coughs> Other questions? Okay, so uh, what exactly will the two articles do? So that article, which is the second one, I took them in reverse order. Okay. Article 18 would change the comptroller from being an appointment of the, and we're going to get to that in a second on the next page. It would take it from being an appointment of the selectman to an appointment of the town manager. And then Article 19 would then create a municipal finance department to put all these people into. Okay, explain exactly how that will work with the controller being appointed that's the next page okay moving on to the next one so the actual recommended vote which is long is is the next page it's front and back So if we go to the back of the first, if we go to the back of the page, because I think the real, real action in all of this occurs in the back of the page, and as a professional accountant myself, this is the stuff I am concerned about, and also actually five years ago when I voted against this, this is why I voted against it. So I'm going to start with the process, I'm going to go right to the last paragraph, which is the process of removing the comptroller, which I talked to about on the last slide actually in the deck. So I'm going to read it. It says, the comptroller may be removed by the town manager, subject to the approval of the selectman. Removal of the comptroller shall become effective upon approval of the selectman. If the selectman shall fail to act, removals made by the town manager shall become effective 
on the 15th day following the day on which notice of the proposed removal is filed with the Board of Selectmen. For the purpose of this section, notice of removal shall be considered filed with the Selectmen when such notice is filed at an open meeting of the Selectmen. So Doug, I think, stole this from Needham. And then, so, so when I read it, right, and we'd gone through, we had looked at all what every other town did and what worked, what didn't work, and we kind of went back and forth. And this one seemed to work the best. And it's one of these paragraphs when I've talked to people, when I've talked to people internally about it that feels problematic until you really start to break down the sentence and tie in the other elements of Massachusetts law. And that's what I did two slides in two slides, which I'll read from when I break down the removal process. So a few things. The first one, it talks about the town manager having to file notice with the Board of Selectmen of their intent to, to terminate the comptroller. So under Massachusetts law, <coughs> notice has to be filed in an open on the selectmen's agenda at least 48 hours before the selectmen's meeting. You can't get away with this being an other business item. This can't be the selectmen go through the whole meeting. Any other business? Yeah, I'm going to fire the comptroller. <laughs> Adjourned. You can't do that. It has to be a posted agenda item. Now, the agenda item can be taken up in executive session because it's a personnel matter, but it has to be a stated agenda item. Failure to post, now this is important. So failure to post this agenda item would make it void, the action void. So the Attorney General very rarely, usually with open meeting violations, they, the Attorney General will make, it, make you read it into the record or will make you go back and re-vote it. This is one of the rare occurrences when I've talked to town council that the action would just be null and void immediately. You have to post it. Um, because it's posted, you now give the selectmen, so we talk about 14 days to act. 14 days is the back end. Because it's a posted agenda item, the selectmen can immediately reject the action. So, town manager goes to selectmen, posts the agenda item, they go into executive session, the town manager says, I would like to terminate the employment of the comptroller. Select would say, well, that's great, but we move disapproval. They're done. They're out of executive session. So they don't have to. And this is important. The selectmen, when you read that paragraph at first, it makes it seem like the selectmen have 14 days to do something and can't do anything at that moment. But because it's a public agenda item, they can deal with it at that moment. What it does, what the 14 days is there, is to provide, because it's a personnel action, it's to provide some protection or, or certainty to an employee. I mean, imagine the town manager posts this as a notice, they go into executive session, the selectmen decide not to act, and now you've got this sort of article of termination over your head for six months. I mean, you can't have that. The selectmen, it really forces the situation to act at that moment. If they choose not to act, they can come back at a subsequent meeting within 14 days, and after that, the town manager can proceed with termination of a control if it was if, if that's what the manager wanted to do. Um, the other interesting thing about Massachusetts general law, and this provides other embedded safeguards, is because it's a personnel action discussing the termination of a municipal employee, the comptroller under this article would have to be invited to the hearing. So you can't have a hearing about the comptroller, the way this is written, without the comptroller appearing to be able to mount their own defense. And so what you really get, as I try, as I try to explain it, it's like the only way I can kind of explain it, it's like an impeachment hearing, right? The town manager would go to the board of selectmen, really to affect it, if something really went wrong. The town manager would have to go to the board of selectmen, most likely would have to bring the director of human resources, town council, probably the deputy town manager, lay out the direct actions for which the comptroller's employment should, he's recommending you know, termination of the comptroller's employment, the comptroller is then present at the meeting, whether the town comptroller wants to bring their own attorney or something like that. Comptroller has a chance to appear before the board and explain their side, and then the selectmen make a decision and an action. So I think this, this section here, unlike five years ago, provides real certainty to a process and doesn't just allow, it's not a situation where the, comp, you know, it's a situation where the, the comptroller has accountability to their boss. You know, if you had written this that only the selectmen can appoint or terminate the comptroller, then there's no accountability. But it doesn't allow for a town manager to just 
you know, a town manager's under the gun, there's financial malfeasance, the controller figures it out, and the controller's gone. It stops that from happening. It's a safeguard. And then the paragraph above it is really the process for appointment. The town manager shall appoint upon merit and fitness alone, the town's comptroller, subject to the approval of the Board of Selectmen. Appointment of the comptroller should become effective upon the approval of the selectmen. Selectmen fail to act. Appointment shall become effective. Same process of filing it, things like that. And this is sort of, you know, this is the exact, it's the same logic as determination, right? You need the selectmen to approve it, but if we've interviewed candidates, we've screened them, we've gotten down to a final three, they have one, it's been brought to the selectmen, they can't just hold it out there indefinitely. We've got to fill the position. We can't leave someone say, hey, we think you're going to be the person, and then 60, 90 days go by and the selectmen don't act. So this sort of puts 13 <coughs> days for them to, the no, 30th day, sorry, 30 days for them to, to act on it. Okay, questions? David? <coughs> Uh, in until the last time an employee was, was removed? Yes. Well, comptroller or? No, any, anybody in administration. Yes. That, that level. Yes, we actually, so, so the town council and I actually wrote this partly, or the processes and the wording, based on the, what I would call bungling of an employee dismissal by the Board of Assessors. So that was. The, no, I'm not, I'm not talking. That was the work. In, in the, no, was it was the director. Okay. Other than that, was that person? You see, what happens is, rather than being removed, there's another option that goes with it. That that option is they resign. Correct. They resign without any repercussion. Yes. Nothing could be said about the negative, uh, on a negative way, because uh, I can't ever remember somebody being removed. Correct. And the, in the situation that we're talking about now, the comptroller, if that was to be removed, the comptroller has a right to, re to be represented by counsel. Mm -hmm. And the comptroller, that employee, we're talking about the comptroller, has a right to have that hearing either in public mm -hmm. or not public. It's up to that person to decide whether it goes. Now, yeah. when the final analysis, the board of would then have to go in in public after executive session to say what they did in executive session. Correct. When it's, when it's final. Correct. Right. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's more than what this, this area is. It, 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 it's, a, it's a long, drawn out process. Yeah, and it's, it's yeah. We're, for, we're, any, any, for any removal. Yeah, and the goal here is to make it miserable. <laughs> well, it can be miserable on both sides. Yeah, that's what we want to do. I mean, look, and let me let me just say this, right? And we talk about terminating employees, but if we go back in in our in our history, without getting very specific, um, the reason you need to make termination of the comptroller a roadblock, a very difficult, painful process, is it was, geez, six years ago that the school department overspent their budget by like a million five, okay, and. Um, I remember sitting in the chair's living room actually talking about this one night. And the comptroller at the time was Ruth Lewis. She never hesitated giving us anything. Hey Ruth, could we have this? Sure. Hey Ruth, could we have this? Sure. And she, you know, while a lot of people I think didn't want her to just hand information over as freely as she did, she handed it over because there was no immediate repercussion that was going to happen to her. Right? She had autonomy, she had the support of the Board of Selectmen, and, and so by creating this to be a really difficult process for termination and public session, private session, that's what you want to create. You want to create, I hope we never have that situation again, where there's an overspending of a budget by a large number, but if we do, I want a comptroller who feels empowered to say, yes, I'm going to hand you this information, even though it's embarrassing and it's going to trigger this, this, and this. So I think it's, it's good in this position to make it difficult. Okay, Joan. So were all of the extra procedures and details that I just mentioned still included, even though they're not actually spelled out here? They're part of state law. 
Okay. That, okay. Yeah. yeah. So that yes. Yeah, it's by the municipal, municipal employee. Okay. Yeah. So this doesn't supersede that. Nope. It adds a layer to it. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Stephen, yeah, the, the, just wondering on when you you look at this and, and compare it to, to state law. It is 15 days enough because the, the rights of an employee to have counsel or to, to appear at a hearing and the, the way this is written <coughs> the selectmen fail to act I think that's designed more or less for the situation where the town manager gives selectmen notice they don't even open a hearing they don't do anything but what about the hearing that opens and it's it's a complicated situation and it drags on for 16 days because it's more than one meeting is, is there um, that maybe a um, potential issue in terms of an effective termination before yes. someone's rights are. Yes. Any, so, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so Doug and I, so with the scenario that town council and I have repeatedly used is the June meeting of the Board of Selectmen because the largest gap between, so selectmen meetings are every 14 days, except for the meeting between June and July, which goes like five, six weeks, and the meeting between July and August which is a big gap in August, September, there's essentially a summer recess. And so what, what we talked about were, were, were a couple things. And, and the first thing is the chair of the board of selectmen sets the agenda. So if you're going to have a topic as heavy as termination of a comptroller, as, as Dave said, you need to have everything in order and ready to go before you can put it on the agenda. So even though the town manager may want to put it on the agenda, <coughs> the chair of the board of selectmen and town council would have to take it off. I mean, town council would have to recommend that it comes off because if you don't have, if you're not ready to go under the personnel laws to have that hearing, even though it says here that the town manager can give notice, you can't put it on. You have to be ready to go. And it's the same thing right now. Like even even under the current bylaw where the, where the selectmen have sole authority to terminate the controller, they can't just put it on their agenda and do it. If, they, if, the, if, the, if the controller hasn't gone through their own process, is retaining counsel, different things like that, they have to keep it off the agenda until the controller is ready to appear. Otherwise, the action isn't, isn't legal. I, I'd just be concerned about the, if the hearing opens, and again, they may be, and this could be, extreme situation hopefully it never happens and there's a legitimate disagreement between the control controller and the town manager selectmen open the hearing and you can't get to the answer right away um, so so back to the june scenario right yeah. so one of the things we talked a lot about is there's this isn't this isn't a zoning article there's nothing that prevents you from bringing it back so The selectmen, so the town manager can go, it's an in-depth hearing, they're in executive session for three hours, it's June, they're not meeting for five weeks, three of the members of the board are flying out of state. The, the, the article, so let me go back and read it, because this is where it gets. So it says, if the selectmen shall fail to act, removal made by the town manager shall become effective. So the action can be, we're not done. We're not ready. We do not approve of this just yet. We're not saying we're not going to do it, but we don't approve of it. It doesn't require the selectmen to take a yes or no and hold to it like a zoning article for two years. So they get a June meeting, have a hearing. They don't feel comfortable. They say, no, you know what? We're not ready. So we're not going to grant approval. We're going to actually tell you it's disapproval, but let's come back in July and keep talking about this. Or let's come back in 17 days, or let's come back in 16 days. The only thing it stops them from doing, or the only thing this requires them to do, is not, if the next meeting isn't for more than four, 15 days, not walking out of the room with it in an open-ended. You know, if the next meeting wasn't for 45 days, they can't walk, well, the last action of the meeting can't be, okay, we'll pick this up in 45 days. They can actually just say, no, we're not ready to approve this, so vote a degree of disapproval, but we'll re we'll reconvene in 45 days if they want. And I think that's the right I'm just concerned. Yeah. I'm not sure this language covers that, but it's, you know, the team of town council and frankly before town meeting. The, the, 
Yeah, the fifteenth day was the one I got hung up on too. Doesn't the whole cycle have to start over again then? <coughs> no. Nope. Because they don't have to vote yes or no. It's not a straight approve disapprove. It doesn't say they approve disapprove. So they act. So they can say yes, we approve. They can do nothing, which I wouldn't do nothing. They can disapprove, or they can say we're not ready to approve, which is a form of disapproval. But you continue over at the hearing at that point. Okay, Charlie. Thank you, um, Dean. Maybe I'm, you know, coming from the dark side here. I like to think I converted to the dark side in the last twelve months, but okay. <laughs> so, um, the board of selectmen are responsible directly to the voters, right? And I would assume that they are responsible to the voters for what I'll call the. Uh, I don't know, the correctness or the rectitude of our financial records and reporting. Is that true? I don't think they are, no. I don't think the latter half is true. Well, who is? I think the comptroller is. Re to the voters? The comptroller is accountable for the proper financial accounting of the town's money. And who? So in the, in the sense of the accountability here, how does that flow? Currently? Well, the controller is, for, is an employee the, of the selectmen. Okay. The, so the, so, the, so the, the controller is responsible for the financial, uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the term of art here? For the management. Management. Yeah. Um, records. records. Financial account oversight. Yeah. Okay. So um, in your organization chart now, I guess the way this is drawn on page 10 of your presentation, mm -hmm. the comptroller reports to the deputy town manager. Yep. Who reports to the town manager, who reports to the board of selectmen. Correct. So how does that accountability work? I mean, the, the, is, the, is the deputy town manager or the town manager now responsible for the, for the financial records? No, oh, the comptroller is responsible. Well, indirectly. Well, hold on. Let's, yeah, let's look at it. Let's look at this a different way. But let me look at this a different way, Charlie. I'll give you a different example. We can all wrap our head around. General Electric, Boston-based public company. They have a chief accounting officer, controller. Okay, does not report to the board of directors. Does not report to the CEO. Reports to the CFO. Every controller in the private sector reports to the CFO. I report to the CFO. So this thought that the, so so let me finish. Wait, wait. Let me finish. So this thought that the controller who's in charge of the books and records has to report to the board of directors is kind of inconsistent. No, that's not my point. Because in private industry, if the books and records get screwed up, the CFO gets fired. Correct. Okay. Okay. So what happens here? I mean, in the, in the, current, in the current scheme of things, at least as I understand it, if the financial records are not accurate and things get screwed up and the... And the um, uh, comptroller is reporting to the board of selectmen. It's the, the comptroller's responsibility, and the comptroller should be out. I, I don't see how this governance works here. That's that's my my question. But 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 that Im but but accountability of the board of selectmen implies that the board of selectmen have the professional competence to oversee. And so, if I put if we went to a board of selectmen meeting and we said, "Hey, look, board of selectmen, I want you to name every single GASB standard." And I want you, because you're in charge of the books and records, and I want you to explain how they work. My guess is they couldn't implement one GASB standard. If you were to explain, okay, explain debits and credit, explain accounting, explain journal entries, explain a sub subsidiary ledger, explain how the AP ledger imports into the general ledger, explain how bank recs work. My guess is that five of them combined couldn't answer those questions. And so it, it, it doesn't see, it's, so we're, we're saying, and, and then I think the next question I would ask would be, Boris Selectman, what time did the last comptroller show up to work? What time did he leave? What did he do? I mean, you supervised him. So what time did he show up and leave? When town hall was open until 7 o'clock on Thursday, did he stay till 7? Did he leave early? Tell me. If they could answer that, I, I would agree with you. Because they would, if they could answer those questions, I'd say, yes, you're, you're, you're in charge. 
I don't think they can answer any of those questions because they're not full-time professional staff. For all anybody in this room knows. Can they answer it about the town manager? But you should have one employee, like any organization, the CEO. Oh, You're yeah. always going to have to have I one think, person. I think that's an argument that has, uh, it's irrelevant for the, for the correct reporting of the books, whether somebody shows up at 9 o'clock or 5 o'clock. Right, but, yeah, but, but you can't your say any more about that than they can about when, what the hours of the town manager might be. I, I'm just trying to understand the responsibility for the financial records. You're saying that it's in the hands of the controller. It is. Um, and and how, does, how does that get to the public? It gets to the public through the deputy town manager the town, and the town manager? Is that... Well, who'd this book come selected? from? This book came from the deputy town manager. It's not, a, it's not an earth shattering change. It, it's a, in any way, it's an improvement. Because you have a comptroller that has professional supervision, unlike right now, which I'll go back to, which is look, if the selectmen can walk in here and regurgitate one GASB standard. As a matter of fact, this is the Finance Committee. I'd have a competition. I'm a CPA, right? Licensed CPA. I'll have a competition, me against everyone in this room, who can regurgitate more GASBs. And I'm probably going to win. Who can regurgitate more FASB standards? Well, there are no FASB standards because they codified them. So who can, who can regurgitate more ASCs? I probably could. So to say that non-professionals are somehow providing oversight of the financial information, it's not, it's not true. It's not, it's not there. Okay. Well, wait, let's, uh, okay, Christine, you want to with you that the Board of Selectmen could not help, help um, beat you with GASB standards. But I think each one of them, and I entrust each one of them to know what stealing money means. And here, this this proposal is, it's, uh, first of all, I, I have great confidence in our, in our current town manager, but I'm thinking long term. What, what prevents a town manager or a deputy town manager to hire some very weak person, marginalize that person, so that person would never even know that there's something to go to the town, the board is selecting about. I think Charlie's point is that we want that final check, that accountability, and have the control, controller <coughs> able to not, to, to, to report directly to the board of selectmen. So, what prevents it now? Well, now the controller reports to the board of selectmen. Right. So let me, let me get three interesting things. So the current controller was talking about leaving. Okay? And when he was talking about leaving, they said, oh, crap. First thing they thought is we have to talk about evaluating and things like that. And we haven't done, he's been here two and a half years and we haven't done an evaluation of him. So in an open session of the board of selectmen, they said, we have to do an evaluation of the controller. Here's what we're going to do. Joe Kira, I'm, Joe Kira says, I'm chair of the board of selectmen. I'm going to go talk to Dean. Sandy and Paul Tierney about what type of job the comptroller is doing. And Steve Byrne is vice chair. You're going to go talk to these people. And together, it's not a 360 eval, but together we're going to find out what he does and how well he does in his job. And that was in a public session. So if you go watch it, that's what they said. And then Joe Carroll scheduled a meeting with me, and he literally said to me, how's Rich doing? I said, what? And if you ask him, he said, he'll probably tell you the meeting was over in five minutes. Because I thought it was aggravating. So you're in charge of oversight, but you're asking me what he does? That's not right. And so that's the oversight we have. And then so Rich leaves. And now we have to have a comptroller, right? And we have the Board of Selectmen, and they're the guardians of the, at the gate. So they have a selection committee. The selection committee is the town manager, the town treasurer, the chair of the Board of Selectmen, and two other professional town staff. So the answer to your question is the current situation is if Adam, me, Adam, Paul, and Sandy want to hire someone weak, we could do it. We could do it right now. There's nothing that can stop me. We're the ones reviewing the resumes with Karen Malloy. So I don't, I don't, I don't see, we, we like to think that this current structure has done things for us. In some ways, it's just outdated. Okay, Alan and then David. Just on, on this topic for the enlightenment of our thousands of viewers, what role do the outside auditors play in protecting the financial <laughs> integrity of the town? Well, 
they provide your they provide some of your biggest balance. I mean, they're the ones who are going through and doing detailed testing on transactions and journal <coughs> entries and making sure things are properly accounted for and that they're in the right account and that they're in the right fund and that things aren't being moved, that we're complying with accounting rules, that we're complying with state rules. And frankly, anyone that's ever done the job realizes that they're, the com they're really the comptroller's best friend because they issue a management letter. And you'll always notice when new comptrollers show up. You noticed it when Rich showed up, you'll notice when the next comptroller shows up. Notice how the management letter gets this big all of a sudden. Look, it's as big because if you're the comptroller, you just give it to the auditors. And you say, here are all the problems we have. Help me deal with them. Comptroller writes a management letter. We have an audit committee meeting. Oh, everybody goes like this, that we have these problems. And then we deal with them over the next year. So if there was this grand conspiracy and a funny business and money was going into the wrong pockets, what are the odds that the auditors would catch that? I don't know how they wouldn't. I mean, it, how they wouldn't catch something that wasn't, if there was a, again, one of the things I think we've all learned about um, financial controls and internal controls and things <coughs> like that is um, you're never going to catch collusion. Well, you're not never going to, it's tough to catch collusion. I mean, they say that in every auditing standard out there. You take an auditing class and they tell you that collusion is the toughest thing to catch. That's a lot more. Right, right. So, so if the treasurer and the comptroller are colluding, it's going to be very, very difficult. But after that, I mean, I mean, a lot of this stuff is pretty, pretty straightforward to figure out. You know, how do we account for things? What fund is it in? What line items it in? I mean, especially in a digital world. I mean, it's, you know, it's a lot different than it used to be. I mean, you can, you know, one of the things the auditors do now is they have this auditing standards, it's, it's called something else, it's called SAS 99. And they just go through and test journal entries. It's one of these post-Enron things. So if you're cooking the books and you're booking funny entries, so when I used to work at Deloitte, we'd run it through this data in in integration, interrogation, whatever you call it, tool. And you look for all the weird things. Entries that are posted late at night, entries that are posted on the weekend, balances that don't ma make sense, right? So you, you, you debited fixed assets and you credited revenue. You're like, why the hell did that happen, right? Um, you go through and you look for all those things. You go into the journal entry detail, you pull out all the magic words, per order of, forced to do, because what they learned through a lot of times with fraud management, on the private company side is when people feel stressed to do things, they actually just write what they were told to do in the journal entry detail, so if they get caught, <laughs> it's right there. And so you find all the answers right there. And so there's a lot of things you can do on an audit side to catch this stuff. And it's a lot different now because audits are now designed more than ever to catch these things. Okay. Uh, David? Can we... David? Um, Dean, on the uh, app itself, it says um, to make the comptroller appointment, an appointment of the town manager if I take any action uh, way to there too. That's, uh, the town manager would appoint the comptroller, but um, with the approval of the board of selectmen. Correct. It doesn't say that in the article, but I mean, if someone. It says it in the vote. It, it has to have the approval of the board of selectmen. Yeah, in the vote it does say, subject to the approval of the selectmen, which is actually how it works right now. Right. So essentially right now, the town manager is going to do a search committee, figure it out, send it to the, the selectmen for, for approval. And just on a side note, you mentioned what the board of selectmen might not know. I bet you, that you, if you ask the five selectmen, the current five selectmen, do they have arrest powers by virtue of their office? <laughs> do they? Do they or don't they? Yeah. The answer to that question is yes, they do. On one, only a circumstance of just disturbance of the peace in a public setting. Hmm. It's an old blue law. Never haven't seen it enforced, but it's a blue law. Yeah, I, I would just like to go back to this question question of, uh, of governance here. And, uh, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the analogy with the private sector that I tried to raise before is that uh, typically the CFO's neck is on the line to, uh, to an audit committee of the board or to the board director. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, the way the town has been structured for the last hundred years is that the comptroller has, quote unquote, had his or her neck on the line 
uh, to the to the representatives of the people, which is the board of selectmen. There is nothing in this article or in this structure that clarifies that responsibility to the board of selectmen, except for the town manager. And and I would remind you that it wasn't so many years ago, and I won't get into names or subjects, but we had some uh, very questionable individual in charge of the town. And, and that could happen again. I mean, we've had some, and we still have a great we have a great town manager now. We've had some. You know, with, with one exception in my time in that we've had really outstanding town management. It doesn't mean we're always going to have that. And, um, and I think this structure, um, as proposed, is flawed because it doesn't address that issue of financial responsibility and governance, except through the town manager, who is, uh, you know... Um, but I don't... Subject, subject to flaws. Okay. Um, if something goes horribly wrong in the police department, now the police chief doesn't report to the town manager. So I think the same analogy extended would say the police chief's not accountable to anyone. If there was a horrible action in the fire department, I mean really like a terrible thing, like the fire chief is an old, it's a banning building, it's Saturday night, decides to call everyone and sends them into the building, building collapses, they all die. Under the same example, the fire chief's not accountable. He's not an appointment of the selectmen. I mean, if we were to say that you have to be an appointment of the selectmen to be accountable, nobody's accountable in town government anymore. Nobody. A and I don't see how nobody's accountable. I mean, you know who's in charge of what. They have job titles, they have positions, they have responsibilities. I don't think moving this position away from the selectmen takes responsibility away from this position or accountability away. Okay. Uh, Paul? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm sure I'm going to what you said the first time. Um, while the controller is responsible for maintaining the books of the town, the deputy town manager of the finance department is responsible for making sure that the controller does not. And indeed, the controller is up. And the deputy manager of the finance department is the deal with it. He's cutting in and out. Yes. Yeah. We're not hearing you, Paul. Uh, you're, you're, yeah. you're breaking up too much. Yeah, you're breaking up. Text the question. Yeah, there's a problem with Skype. I'm afraid. Ask him if he has a cell phone. Can you te can you text yeah. Alan? No, ask him if he has his cell phone. Okay. I do. Do you have your phone, Paul? Pick it up. <laughs> Hi there. He's on. Go ahead. Can you hear me well there? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So, Charlie had his first point of if the, um, the controller has responsibility for keeping the books, uh, and that, but the deputy town manager or finance director has responsibility for making sure the comptroller does his job. And if the comptroller screws up and the deputy town manager doesn't deal with that appropriately, then the, the deputy town manager should be fired. And if the town manager doesn't currently supervise the deputy town manager to make sure that happens, the selectmen should fire the town manager. So there is accountability all the way up the hierarchy from the comptroller to the selectmen in that case. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your quick action, Dean. Yes. <laughs> I don't mean to hang up on you, but I'm going to hang up on you. <laughs> 
Okay, are there any questions on Articles 18 or 19? They should probably reverse this. But 19 is the Finance Department, 18 is the Controller. Okay, uh, keep in mind when dealing with the Controller um, that it is a heavy re heavily regulated uh, position uh, by the Department of Revenue. So it's, it's a lot of what he or she does is in state law um, and state regulation. Mm -hmm. um, okay, you have one other article. Two. The two other articles. Eight and nine. Okay. I can cover them pretty quick. <coughs> which one's the pie chart and which one's the, which one's which? Okay, eight is the addition of certain delinquent municipal fee, uh, fees and fines to be a lien on real estate accounts. Yep. So I handed that page out as well. That's the standalone page, page that you all received. Did you all get these things? Yeah, it says Article 21 on it. Yeah. Article 21. I call no, but you know what it was? It was Article 21 of last year's town meeting, and we didn't take any action on it. And so, as an accountant, one thing you learn is that plagiarism is the greatest form of flattery. And so, rather than having an original thought, I just resubmitted it. <laughs> That's not just financial, you know. <laughs> yeah, you plagiarize. I mean, that's what we do as it comes. So, what was Article 21, which is now Article 8? Okay. When I became treasurer, one of the things I learned was that the Director of Health and Human Services, though she has the power to impose fines and penalties, doesn't actually have an ability to enforce them. And so, one of the things that she was very frustrated about when we first met was that she has had situations where she's had to go onto properties and remove junk cars. So you've got this car, it's up on cinder blocks, no play, it's off the road, it's really an eyesore. HHS takes an action, they remove it. Now they want to assess a penalty for the cost of removal to the homeowner. Homeowner says, thank you for the penalty, but well, I'm not gonna pay it. So at that point, they don't have an in-town course of action to remediate the situation. What they have to do is they have to go through the courts. And what, we've, what they've learned over time is that courts are not real, um, I don't want to say caring, but they, they really don't want to be dealing with these smaller civil municipal matters. And so what this bylaw does is, this, so that the section, chapter 40, section 58 of the general laws, requires if you're going to take a fine penalty or unpaid fee and lean it on the property, you have to specifically name it. You can't do these broad-based things, right? Like, anything that the HHS or fire department or police department want to do. It has to be very, very specific. And so this first item, item G, is just that. <coughs> it says if they go and they remove, they have to, you're, you're hoarding and they remove junk cars and things like that from your, from your property, after they do it, they're gonna bill you for it. If you refuse to pay the bill, it's gonna get leaned onto your property. And so that's really kind of that simple. Um, the second one is, I don't know if this one's going to stay. G's going to stay, we know that. That was the main one. H, we don't know at this point if it's going to stay. Town Council is going to bring it back to the selectmen. This was just sort of different licenses and things like that that people didn't um, pay for. So I, I, that's sort of in limbo right now. I, charge the set for enforcement, <coughs> noise abatement is, again, this is kind of interesting. They had a situation with a developer in town, they're developing a property. They were just sort of thumbing their nose at the noise abatement law, fines, penalties, fines, penalties, fines, penalty, and they were sort of collecting them and ripping them up and throwing them out. There's no way to enforce it. And so they ended up selling the property, and once they sell the property, it's really difficult to go to the person that bought it and be like, hey, you wanna pay these? And at that point, if you start a court proceeding, it's way too late. And so this is really just saying, look, if you violate the noise abatement bylaw to such a degree that you've been fined or penalized, we're going to have a means as a town to collect on that. You can't just sort of take the penalty and chuck it in the trash. Okay, you can do this, like, for example, now with water and sewer. You can do it with all of your core bills. You can do it with property, real estate tax, water and sewer. I don't think you do it with excise, and then you can do it with every, A through F is the existing bylaw. So those were already approved 
by town meeting. Okay. So those aren't new. Are there any questions? Okay, David and then Grant. Question on I. Um, what would be the mechanism for enforcement? You know, the, you know, you, I mean, like the example you brought up, someone developing a house, building a house, and do your point of thumb on their nose. At the 3 a.m. jackhammers. Exactly. Yep. So how would you then, are you leaning the property and prohibiting a sale until the, you know, it's settled? Is that? So one of the interesting things about municipal law is you have to clear all liens and have clear title and no yeah. taxes before it goes. Exactly. So if you have a developer that's just deciding to just thumb their nose at things, you got the 3 a.m. jackhammers, you got the wild things, you get fines and penalties, you issue them, they refuse to um, pay them. Once you lien it, the town now has an obligation that has to be cleared on the sale of the property. Yeah. So that's going to be the primary mechanism. Uh, that's it. And then what about like an example of um, like things that was putting on an addition? Maybe they left for a couple months. How would you then? I mean, it probably isn't as a likely scenario, but what would you do in that situation? Putting on addition for? Like let's say you someone hired a construction company, like you know, put on addition to a house. Yeah. Like oh, the different owner. Yeah, the same owner, but like same owner. it's just, just the same it. process. You're gonna it's the same process. Yeah, because yeah, it gets leaned on the property, not on the on the business. Yeah. And so, and look, and and I would say, I moved to Arlington. I bought this small cape where the second floor was an attic, and we put a second floor on, we turned it into colonial, put an attic on it, we put a um, a deck on the back, and we've done a ton of work to the house over the course of 16 years, whatever it's been. And ultimately, though, it's my contractor that's doing all the work, yeah. sort of like the prior example, I'm responsible to supervise yeah. him. Like, if he decided to go, like, rip away at, you know, putting that addition on at 3 a.m., 4 a.m. outside, then it's something to deal with. I mean, I, I have to be responsible. So if, if I don't maintain order on my property, contractor runs wild, then I pay the penalty, ultimately, as the homeowner. Grant? Same kind of rule with the um, um, junk car, landlord, it's a tenant's junk car, but the landlord's responsible for it. Pure tenant. Same idea. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Peter? Uh, Dean, how quickly can you uh, establish a lien? Yeah. It, so what could we do and what or what do we do? Well, if, I mean, if, if the property issue, you, you don't want to delay too long. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I think, I think we'd probably, we'd probably bifurcate this, right? I might move a little quicker than everyone else. But um, generally what we do, like on the real estate tax side is, well, on real estate tax, we only do liens once a year. And so <laughs> you didn't pay Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. We'd send you, we, we wouldn't lean you after each one. We'd actually let you go the whole year without pay. Then we start to send you out notices. Like, hey, you know, and we, and we, we escalate the notices, right? The first one will be a, a letter to your house that we just drop into the mail. Second one will be a certified letter to your house. Now we're going to start. all the real, real estate. Oh, but even on, if we were going to do other ones of these that aren't, um, that are just an ordinary course of the existing ones, we'd start sending you. FedEx, UPS, things like that. Then when then we send a letter saying, okay, you're not responding. Now we're going to put a lien on. And then usually people respond at that point. They come running in and say, okay, we're good. But we don't, we actually currently don't move very quickly. So if they sell the house and the lien hasn't, hasn't been established, then they get away with tearing up the building. Mm -hmm. On, a, if we, on that, so that would be the part, like on a noise abatement or on a noise abatement, yeah, we, would, we might have to move quicker on that one. It would require a change of policy if there was a decision to, to move quicker. But those are just policies that you established? Mm -hmm. David? I mean, actually, that's a really good point. <coughs> Most houses are being built in a four-month cycle, at least from what I can tell, which would you be willing to go up in front of town meeting and say we change our policy to move quickly on this front so that you know we could hit the lien but prior to sale? You know, no, because I'm accountable to no one. We just went over this for like 20 minutes. <laughs> so guess what? No, I won't. I'll do whatever I want. Like that's what happens when you're elected. You can just make crap up all the way. <laughs> but in all sincerity. Yeah. But in all sincerity, yes. I mean, for, for something yeah. like noise, because I think it's such a hot button issue. It, it's such a hot button. In town. Exactly. And 
I think it's something that's very frustrating and it's sort of look, you know, if you get hit with one of these, there's going to be a 30 day or whatever the period is to, um, to adjudicate it. And if you don't, yeah, we might move on this much quicker. Okay. And I think that would give ones. people a lot of comfort that like the methods going to work. You know? Yeah. With the, the flip side to this though, is it does up the game though of, of enforcement uh -huh. in the sense that there better be like, you know, and I was talking to the town manager about this. There can't be like 6.58 a.m. enforcement on a 7 a.m. bylaw. Like, I mean, that would be crazy, right? I mean, we really need to make sure we're saving this for, at that point, they need to be judicious in enforcement. Whereas now I feel like, because there's no way to enforce it, you could be a little looser with it. Yeah, but you tell me, I mean, the law is the law, right? I mean, if it says 7 a.m., then that, that means 7 a.m. So I'm going to put it there for a reason, right? I mean, so I, 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 debate, I, know your, I debate your point. I, I just think, like... What time do you have on your clock? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, listen. I mean, okay. But I think it's a good... That would be very, I think people would be take that really in the right... That was a, that's a really positive step. Yeah. We'll lean quickly because it's, you know, we'll, whenever, you know we've got the people's back. Okay, John? Well, I... I think the important thing is that maybe you just, you just said it, but you know, let me repeat it. The important thing is that Christine can now say, "Well, you're going to have a lien put on your property." Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that junk car is going to get removed very quickly then. Right. And, because and people know that if there's a lien on the property, the property's frozen. And these remain discretionary action. So if you remember the town meeting, a lot of us were there when town meeting voted to put these on. The one we did, I went back to the record, the one we struck out intentionally was ambulance billing. Because you don't choose to have a heart attack. Right. <laughs> so there's sort of a moral nature here of attaching that. These are, these are choices you've made. To put a car on, to not properly dispose of your car, or to start you know, jacking hammering at 3 a.m., something like that. Okay. Why don't we uh, go to the last one, which is nine? Oh, this one's real easy. Okay, sure. <laughs> so everybody got their Q3 tax bill, which is your February tax bill. And under the bylaw, which I didn't print out, town treasurer's office is required to put this pie chart in the middle of the, of the, of the tax bill. And it breaks down where your money goes and things like that. I think it was put in um, to the bylaw in the, year, in the 2000 town meeting. And it worked very well when we were using ICS, the old software, because we'd do it internally, wouldn't cost us anything, smack dab, put it in the middle of the tax bill, off we went. When we moved to Munis in Invoice Cloud, the new system follows the standard Massachusetts um, package for tax bills. So what is the standard package that the DOR, what's the standard form for tax bill that DOR says it should be? And that's what we, we send out. And any change after that is a custom job. And so when you go home and you look at your Q3 tax bill, it costs the treasurer's office $1,000 to put that onto your tax bill. And we actually screwed up the tax rate the first time we did it, so we had to fix it. It would almost cost us $2,000 to put that on the middle of your bill. And so the question really that people, that the selectmen have already voted favorably on this question, I guess you would have to think about is, is that a $1,000 pie chart? Is that pie chart worth a thousand bucks? Now in the year 2000, when we didn't have the internet and we didn't have all this access to information, couldn't look things up quickly, and that was a source of where your money went, yeah, it was a thousand dollar pie chart. It's not a thousand dollar pie chart today. And so I would like to not have to spend a thousand dollars doing it. There's a secondary issue. Because it's a custom job, we no longer have control over the timing of putting the bill out. So if we reached a scenario, so the tax bills have to go up by January 1. If we reached a scenario where the tax bills were going out, where we were behind in the process and we didn't get the tax rate certified, didn't get the bills going, and we were kind of pushing up against that deadline, we now have to leave room for getting the pie chart done. So you could find yourself in a situation where the Treasurer's Office has to make a choice. Violate state law and get the bills on January 1, or violate the town bylaws with a pie chart. Now, I'm going to assure you that we've already made a decision that the bylaw is going to go by the wayside at that point because we're not going to violate state law to get a pie chart on, right? And so that's kind of the secondary problem is we already have a sprint to get 
the tax bills out for January 1 because the tax rate doesn't get set until like the December 7th-ish when the Board of Selectmen meet. <coughs> so because it's a custom job, it, it's going to make for a longer lead time. Okay, uh, Charlie. Dean, isn't there a scholarship um, box, checkbox on the tax bills? Isn't that a custom job also? So what we did to get that to work is so the Town of Arlington Scholarship Committee runs through home rule legislation. There is statewide legislation for scholarship checkoff box donations. And so we're using the uh, applicable state statute for scholarship checkoff box to put that on. So that, that can be applied to the Arlington Fund? Correct. And so same thing with like, um, what was that thing? I was going to call it widows and orphans, but it's not. Widows and Elves, there was a fund we created last year in town meeting under a state statute, so we can use the, that's part of the standard options as well. Okay, are there any other questions on this article? Okay, um, now this, you said the selectmen have voted favorably. On, on eight and nine. On, eight, on both. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you five know oh, if it was oh. unanimous or yep. not? Five oh, five oh. Five oh? Yep. Okay. Okay, well, I want to thank you very much for coming. We appreciate your time. Great to see you, everyone. Okay, take care. I'll take those cookies. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> this is pie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Article 8 and 9. Why don't we go backwards? Um, the selectmen have voted favorable action unanimously. Um, should we just ride with their vote, or does anybody want to take a contrary position? or? Okay, and the selectmen have voted favorable action unanimously on the pie charts, or getting rid of the pie charts. Does anybody just let that ride and uh, comfortable with that? Okay. Okay, let's get to the fun part. Okay. Uh, Article 18 and Article 19. Um, Article 19 is the home rule. Uh, legislation to create a municipal finance department uh, and then 18 is the controller um, municipal the finance department is something that you know we've debated before um, you've heard uh, Dean's arguments uh, what is the will of the committee on the uh, municipal finance department John, you look like you want to jump up. No, I, I, was, I would move action. Okay, so are you moving favorable action? Yeah, right. That's on Article 19? Yeah. On okay. The, on the Finance Department. Finance Department. Okay, is there a second to that? Second. Okay, discussion. <coughs> that, does, that still does not include the schools, correct? No. no. That's full Vote to authorize the board of selectmen to file home rule legislation on the creation of consolidated finance, municipal finance department. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I don't think there's any intention to bring the schools into it. I think the school committee has made itself quite clear. I wanted that on Kate. Uh, yep. And actually, I think there's probably no way that the town could force the schools into it if the schools didn't want to join anyway uh, on it. But I don't think that's their intention at all. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, all those uh, moved and seconded for favorable action on Article 19, which is the Consolidated Municipal Finance Department. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. <laughs> oh, yes, forgot you, Paul, sorry. Uh, Paul's uh, 21st today, right? Correct. Okay. okay, now, the Home Rule Legislation Appointment of the Town Controller, that's the legislation at the end of uh, Dean's handout, an, out, an act amending the Town Manager Act of uh, Arlington Road to the appointment and management of the Town Controller. All, um, discussion? Motion? So okay, I'm sorry, who said that? Okay, David, move sorry. favorable action? Yes. 
Okay. It's second. 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 Discussion. Okay. All those in favor of favorable action on the uh, appointment of the town controller, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Okay. And you've got one from uh, Paul, is positive too. Paul as well. No, he's negative. Oh. Paul, what's your vote? Are you up or are you down? Oh, he's up. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Everybody <laughs> who's in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Opposed? One, two, three. Okay, 11 to 3, 1, 2, 21, 18. Now, since these are in the middle of the uh, selectman articles, uh, my, my thought would be uh, that we get their vote, and then I would just put in that the Finance Committee su supports the vote, vote of the Board of Selectmen, and you know, not get into having two conflicting uh, articles. So, uh, but we'll, We'll be getting to that when this whole thing gets organized. 9.30, does anybody have any budgets? Yeah, we do. Nope. We'll okay. Do the so we'll do the library, but I, I, have, um, I have some things to pass out. This one, I don't have enough of for everybody. It's in that time. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> that one's double-sided, and then this one, there should be one for everybody. Um. <coughs> okay, so the library is on page 142. <laughs> I'll go over what it's about. <coughs> All right, so if you look at the salaries, you notice the increase, and the increase is due to adding an adult services librarian, uh, a full-time adult services librarian. And the reason I passed out those sheets is so that you can see um, why we needed one and what the rationale was. I mean, if you look at those two charts, you can see that I gave you the part that was the comparison of total circulation, which ours is second only to Lexington's in this group of comparison with local towns. But if you look at the professional staffing levels, you'll see that Arlington, prior to wanting to implement the adult services librarian, had many fewer FTEs when we have, you know, one of the highest circulation rates in, in the state. So that's what I am um, sure. Does that mean we're more efficient than they are? I just got something. <laughs> uh, but we're fairly, I mean, she does a lot of work and she has, you know, she has to do a lot and we have to split time between the libraries and also the other piece I handed out was just so you all can see how many there's some stats on it and you can see all the different programs that are done by the uh, adult services librarian and <coughs> I think part of what this points out is how much the library integrates itself into the town and engages the different um, groups and communities within the town and also works with the other committees that are within the town. So that's mostly why I gave this up to you all, just so you can understand why the library asked for a, a full-time adult services librarian. Um, so what else did I want to say? In case there were questions that line item under library expenses, other contracted services, that's mostly to pay to be part of the Minuteman Library Network. And if you look further down that page, the, at the bottom of the page, the Friends of the Fox Offsets is helping, helps with the staffing at the Fox Library. Um, and a lot of, 
Yeah. I just like to point something out relative to your statement about us being efficient. If this additional person is added, it makes almost no change in that 0.3 number there. It's still very small. That 0.3 is uh, per thousand in population. So the, the one small increment of the additional person is going to make almost no change in our level of efficiency as interpreted by you. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yep. So, and I think the library uses its money well. It works really hard with um, other groups to get money, like the Friends of the Fox Library, and the Friends of the Library, and the Trustees of the Library. Um, and you can see, so Andrea said they get over a thousand people every day. Is that right? Yes. Um, and that we have really innovative programs, um, there is Saturday, the Saturday hours at the Fox have been very successful. Um, and there's a lot more circulation now with e-content, not just with the, the hard 3D books. Um, and if you look at that chart I handed out to you, the adult services, the visits to the, li the Robbins Library have been going up every year. Um, so, anyway, um, but yes? So, when I'm looking at the salary detail, I see under adult services, I see three listed, and I see two vacant, and mm -hmm. one of those vacant does not have a previous. So, is that the new position? Yes. Okay. And is that money in the library salaries budget above already. What, I, so okay, so this this budget is for a total of fifty two oh one fifteen for this new person. If you look at the salary line under the second vacant. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that fifty two oh one five inside if you come up to the budget itself, the first line item, salaries and wages. Is it in there? Yes. Yes. So, and, and yet, with that added person, you're o they're only increasing the budget by 3.4 percent? Yes. In this, in this particular year, mostly because there isn't a lot, any longevities this year. And the budget itself is still under the required amount. The increase is under the required amount. Yes. How did they manage to do that? Numbers. They cut, they cut maintenance. They cut furniture and equipment for this year. But otherwise, everything's the same. Right. So I can't remember everything she said about um, how she's moving people around. But the adult services librarian will be full time will be a full-time adult services librarian. And then um, the one vacancy is for that new person. The other vacancy I think <coughs> is temporary. So maybe that's how they did it. I don't remember exactly how she was moving these people around. Just that her priority was to have an adult services librarian. Uh, have an additional, additional, an additional adult services. <coughs> so she's mm -hmm. filling in the process. She's in the process of filling two positions right now, or that's what she'd like to do. she yeah, she'd like a full-time adult services librarian. But how? Um, I don't. I really don't remember how she said she was moving people around so that um, they could stay and do a specific job, but that the adult services librarian would be uh, full time. Well, she, she'll have three total. Adult service librarian, no, I don't. Yes, yeah. according to salary, she'll okay. have three. Which is fine. I mean, from my perspective, this looks great. She's adding a whole nother full-time person, and um, 
and it's within the budget. Right. But I think that she makes good use of the money and the um, qualifications of the people that she has, and then the kinds of programs that they offer right. to you know diverse communities. And Charlie, yeah, I, I just uh, just for the committee's purposes, I noticed there are at least uh, three positions here where the new pay is lower than the um, prior pay. So um, there must be some people starting out at a lower at a lower rate or something like that. That makes okay. allows allows the additional person to be on board without a significant increase in the overall budget. Right, which is the point she wanted to make. But it's a small percentage of the increase of the total budget. Are there any other questions, Alan? Uh, of oh. Pong. No, I was going to say, and then they do a lot of resource sharing among the librarians. But mostly she wanted the adult services librarian to be a full-time adult services librarian and not have to do, be a, ch a children's librarian and you know, have them do what they do and have the technology librarian be a full-time technology librarian and not be shifting them around. Yes. Uh, this is from Paul. Uh, is grant money going up or down? Grant money. For the state? The state. Or... Paul, can you try talking? <laughs> or texting? Uh, like, I, don't, I don't understand the question about grant money. Well, they, okay, there's library money that comes from the state that's on the cherry sheet, and it's an offset, and it goes directly to the library is that going up or down oh, i i did not ask that question we can look at the chart didn't we get the cherry sheet last week did we get or no we didn't get that much yeah. detail is it I will ask. okay if you could find that out uh -huh. and david how long does the uh, there's two to your point there's two current adult services librarians the there and one of them is a vacant position how long has that position been vacant Um, I think it's vacant because they haven't hired the, I forget, that part I, I can't answer because I think it has more to do with how they were rearranging people and they don't have a full time, well in the budget now that's what they want is to have a full time, like uh, adult services librarian. They want but, but they want I mean, three in total, an additional full time, three in total. But one of those three, so there's two currently. One is proposed additional, but one of the two current is vacant. How long is that position been vacant? My guess is that the vacancies probably came in, in the fall, and they don't move to fill them right away because they want to see if the manager's going to approve what the budget looks like, or maybe even yeah. uh, how far this gets. And uh, remember, this is not going to be there until next year. Right. So they don't want to hire. No, I'm saying but one, I of, the, will ask yeah, one of the I well, will one ask. person's vacant. So to your point, there could be an existing oh, vacancy that's right. in there for six months, right? Okay. And we've done all this work uh, with, um, yeah. I'm just but. saying, we've, one person's currently employed as an adult services librarian. There's another been a vacancy, maybe to your point, it's six months, and we want to bring in another person. You know, we, it seems like uh, maybe we should evaluate there's two, if two is sufficient for the we service. We should evaluate what? If two or two full time people are sufficient to uh, to handle the this you know the uh, services are been mm -hmm. I think that's what they've had. Yeah. Right. Two well, one of those people is vacant. Yeah. The, the arch, the name arch that's there, and. Um, and Windruff, Arch and Windruff were there. Mm -hmm. And now Arch has left. Arch has left. Okay. And then she wants to add the one that, that's vacant. So how long is, how, when did Arch leave? I don't know. No. But I can't. Fairly recently. Fairly recently. Okay. Yeah. So maybe a month ago. Yeah. So that's the next one. We don't know for sure, but fairly recent. Yeah. So the, the new position she's asking for is that one that's blank with. Okay. Right under board. So it sounds like there have been two, and two full time. Yeah. And Arch no. just recently left. 
Right. So she's down. Yeah. Yeah, I see four. four. Now, but what she'd like that. I see four. Is, she the the okay. is there any other uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, Mary Margaret, what's your motion? Well, um, I move that we uh, approve that bottom line number. Two million four one three eight three five. Seconded. Okay, that's seconded. Uh, for the discussion. David? I'll just, I just want to go on record. Um, I, I totally get why you'd want to add someone. I'm just, I'm very nervous about the five-year plan. I'm just wondering if we can try to see what a year looks like without an additional person. But I think we've already done that. But I will ask her to tell me exactly who was where when. Yeah, so I'm just, that. you know, again, if, if there's ways to save a few dollars mm -hmm. between now and next year, I think it's a good thing. I do. Okay. I really do. Okay. So a motion has been made and seconded for favorable action on the bottom line. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And twelve. 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 Okay. Thirteen. Opposed? Okay. 13 to 1, uh, 2, 21, 18. Okay, any other budgets? David? I'll attempt to do the finance <laughs> budget. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So I'm going to ask you to do this. Just uh, an adjustment um, yeah. on the uh, administrative assistance. Exactly. That's page uh, 20 and 21. Okay. For FY19, we're adding an additional $250 to make that figure 5000 And the uh, total would then be 10550 for the finance committee. Okay, so salaries and wages, $8,050. Otherwise unclassified, $2,500. Right. Total, $10,550? Yes. Is that your motion? Yes. Okay. Is it second? Second. Okay. Any discussion or questions? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Any others? Yes, we'll go to the uh, town clerk's budget on page 62 and 63. <coughs> You'll notice that the uh, figure is 10,607 less than last year, and that's doing the same thing for uh, a new hire that was hired less than the or salary less, less than the, the, uh, the first one you see. Only not the budget stays the same. Okay, so what is your and motion? That figure is uh, 266719 Okay. Is there a second? Second. second. Right. Okay, uh, any, is yours, any interesting? Things about the town clerk's budget this year? Well, what's interesting is the town, if you notice, the town clerk's budget really hasn't increased that much on a regular basis. However, um, they've had to ask in the past transfers because of multiple elections and special elections and whatnot. But um, they're, they're, <coughs> they're possibly going to be a special, um, an early election for the state primary and the general election in September and November. Um, it's not it hasn't been finalized as, as to what's going to happen, but it appears there's going to be five days prior to the um, September primary and five days prior to the general election that there will be an early election, similar to what we did for the presidential election. But it won't want to, it will not run 11 straight days like before. 
but it has not been finalized yet. In other words, the polls will open. The polls will open. It, it appears what might happen is um, a learning curve in the first time that was done, that they're going to have two voting polls in the town hall. So the district that uh, Representative Garvey has, it would be on one ballot, and the district in one voting poll, and for uh, Representative Rogers, that would be in another voting poll. It would either be on the, one would be on the first floor of the old town hall, uh, the town hall, or in the, and the other one would be in, possibly in the line room upstairs, but that hasn't been finalized yet. Okay. So that's all. Any questions? I'd like to comment that the uh, cost of doing that, she doesn't really have a handle on it. In any case, it's just uncertain. She probably shouldn't be in the budget, but it might have an effect on the, a small effect on the uh, reserve fund. Okay. And one other thing, it could also be, uh, and again, this has been um, being in the Secretary of State, that could be um, allowed to register to vote that day. But that, that isn't final, I Interesting article in the newspaper. Uh, see it today? <coughs> oh, excuse me. I didn't realize I was allergic to the court's budget. Uh, uh, that the way that we're going towards security of our election system is paper. So we're way ahead of them. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a simple, fast, system it's, uh, yeah, and it right has right. no hanging chats <laughs> but she doesn't have any idea of how long bro or not on them or I'll say for voting this so they may uh, I'm gonna try to pursue that okay I mean she could put it on a computer that's not attached that's not attached to the internet but their, their computers are attached yeah no. okay are there any other questions on the town clerk's budget? Okay, position is uh, motion has been made and seconded for 266 719. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, you may have favorable action. All right. Unanimous. Any others? Do the uh, veterans. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Page 65, Board of Registrars. Okay. And uh, on page 67, uh, if you notice at the bottom, you see a, um, a figure of 150. Mm -hmm. And that's um, technical support that's done on uh, election. Uh, the day of the election and it's um what we're going to do there is because there's going to be at least three elections we're going to add to that figure another three hundred dollars to give it a total of 450 150 for each election okay so you're adding three hundred dollars to the salaries and wages yes so 52, no, 53, yeah. 50. Uh, 115. Right. It goes to 53, 450. The total would be 69, 165. The change in the uh, total. What's 69, 165. What's the change in the salary number? So five six one five. Okay, so we're adding three hundred dollars, correct? So the salary becomes fifty three one fifteen. Fifty three three fifty. Yes. At the top. No. Yes. No, we're adding no. four hundred fifty. We're adding three hundred. Adding three hundred. It gives you four fifty. So then the total comes to five three four one five. Right. Under salaries. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. How much are we adding? Three hundred. Three hundred. Okay, so salaries and wages is fifty-three one fifteen. Four fifty. 
Four fifteen. Okay, four. Well, one, one's longevity. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, David. So you just tell me what the numbers are. Okay, the total be sixty nine one sixty five for the uh, registers total. Okay. And that's because you anticipate that they will have at two least more the, elections. We know at least that there's going to be three elections yep. at 150 apiece. Because you, um, and we, 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 again. <laughs> this is just a mistake. It's just a mistake. Okay, so it should have been that. Yeah, it should have been. Okay, so your motion is for 69,165. Yes. Is that seconded? Okay. Do you have other questions? I have okay. a question. Okay, Carol. Sorry, I'm still confused. Um, so we're adding 300 to the salary line at the very bottom, and we're making that 450. Is that what? From 150 to 450. On page 67. Right. Okay. And we still have to add that up into salaries and wages, correct? We still have to add 300 more up above on the first page. Uh, right. Salaries and wages, 53115. So, well, wait. There's 53115 down here at, on the salaries, on the bottom salaries page? Just ignore the longevity. Just because yeah. it's a separate line. Right? The longevity is also included here, so you don't Oh, I, yeah. Okay. All right, so that's why. Yeah. Sometimes Not getting used to these budgets after you've been away from them for years yes. <laughs> gets confusing. You're adding, so this really, okay. Okay, any other questions on the uh, registrar's budget? Okay, motion's been made and seconded for 69-165. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Any others, David? That's it for now. Okay. We can do the veterans. Okay. Now, what page? Which is 150. Budget going down. Yes, and part of that is there, um, because Jeff's so good at this, he keeps finding other programs to tap first, so um, he's been really good at finding help for people through all means. Um, he's also now the president of the uh, uh, Massachusetts State Vet Services Program, so that's nice, good for us. and. Ensures that he knows all the uh, all the services he can provide, and I also wanted to remind people that this is one of those budgets that gets reimbursed from the state. So all medical and living expenses are reimbursed at 75 percent. The um, homeless vets can get rent or um, housing assistance, and that's 100 percent reimbursed. And the flags on graves program is also 100 percent reimbursed. Um, so, uh, let's see what else I want to say about that. So the reason the in-state travel, the reason why it went up so much is that until recently, uh, Jeff has not been um, asking for reimbursement on using his own vehicle to be traveling around. And um, so now they are reimbursing him. So that's why that in-state travel line has gone up some. Um, and I would suggest that we approve this budget as stated. Second. Second. Okay. So in other words, we're not really 40,000 in the plus, we're probably only about 10,000 in the plus. Okay, are there any questions? Grant. Um, less aid and assistance, but no reduction in actual services provided, right? 
Right. So it's the there are, it looks for all ways to provide right. services that don't necessarily have to come out of this bucket. Sure, but no loss in those. Correct. Areas. And plus, as we get further away from Iraq and uh, the big troops in Afghanistan, then th these tend to go down again. So it's, we saw the same thing in the 90s, I think, as we got away from the Iraq War I. Okay, are there any other questions on the veterans' services? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Unanimous. Two, I'd like to invoke the very voting rule. <laughs> second. Second. We got three minutes left. Come on. <laughs> Move to adjourn. <laughs> second. Okay. Uh, any other business before the committee? Okay. So our next meeting, you got the handout, uh, is on Monday, the 26th. Uh, the water bodies, um, so same as uh, as in prior years. And then, please, uh, who's going to have budgets for Monday? You'll have budgets, David, Peter, others. You can have part. I can have the facilities. Department. Okay, that'll be good. That's a chunk. Uh, okay, so the way it looks like right now, we'll get the water bodies. We'll vote on that. And then uh, we'll review as many budgets as we have. I'll work with Liz to see about the commissions, committees, and all those miscellaneous items. Maybe we could take action on that. I don't think we will be meeting on Wednesday, the 28th. Uh, and then now, and then we start. Uh, Minuteman is coming in. Stephen, uh, yeah, will I they? Asked them for to send the um, budget summary for us ahead of time. Here. Back to me okay, that'll be fine. If they could get it to us by, uh, well, if you get it electronically. Right, that's why I asked for Okay, that would be great. And just you and Liz work on getting out to everybody. Uh, and then community preservation. So uh, want to try to get as many of these budgets done as we can uh, on Monday. Any other business? Meeting adjourned. All right.